Unverified witness accounts have always been the weak points of ghost stories. But what if a skeptic reverend, a distinguished army commander, or even a king talk about it? Just like in the first part, I will cover the complete backstories of the most famous ghost photos to find out if any of them turned out to be fake. On November 11, 1918, when the armistice came into effect, a squadron portrait of the British Royal Air Force was taken at the HMS Daedalus Training Facility, or as it is more widely known, RNAS Leon Solent Airfield in South England. And something unusual was noticed after Flight Lieutenant Victor Goddard, the later Air Marshal and World War II commander, along with many other pictures, put it on a notice board to let the soldiers who wanted a copy of the image write their names below. It's not easy to spot the strange phenomenon, but if you take a closer look at the fourth man from the left in the top row, another head appears next to his. The only issue with this is that no one was standing there. However, the other World War I veterans in the photo claimed that the face was identical to Freddie Jackson, an air mechanic, who died in an accident two days prior to the image being taken after walking too close to an airplane propeller, and his funeral took place on the day of the photo shoot. The story of the photo was first published in 1975 in Goddard's book. In Flight Towards Reality, he revealed that the image was examined thoroughly, but experts concluded it wasn't manipulated. He wrote that, I have a photograph in front of me, taken at Cranwell officially by Bassanos at the time of armistice after the First World War. The squadron, of which the photograph was taken, had no future. It was to be disbanded, and almost everyone then photographed was also in transition back to that less authoritarian life. Those who scanned the photograph identifying friends then saw, or they were prompted then to see the face of Freddie Jackson, air mechanic, in the topmost row, capless and smiling, his face being partly hidden by another. His expression seemed to say, my goodness me, I nearly failed to make it. They didn't wait or leave a place for me, the blighters. What is somewhat unusual, to say the least, is the official photograph and some 200 witnesses who knew. Also the certainty that there had been no hanky-panky in the dark room. Not only would Bassanos not have dared to fake it, the negative was scrutinized for faking and was found to be untouched. It is important to emphasize that this photo is as official as possible. The photo studio of the aforementioned Alexander Bassano opened in the 1850s in London and became one of the most important studios in the country, while Bassano himself was a leading royal and high society portrait photographer in Victorian London. The master retired in 1903, but his brand remained popular throughout the century. Today, over 40,000 Bassano negatives are held at the British National Portrait Gallery, and this is the most probable place where the original negative of the Goddard Squadron ghost photo is kept. But skepticism still remained because, for example, if you compare the face of the supposed ghost and the soldier in front of it, they align almost perfectly, which suggests a simple photo error. On the other hand, the specter is clearly going bald, while half of the soldier's forehead is covered by the service cap. We must talk about Blake Smith, too, a journalist who tried to investigate the origins of the story, but couldn't find any records on Freddie Jackson or the propeller incident. There was only a Frederick William Jackson, who died of heart failure in an infirmary on October 30, 1918, after being discharged in March of 1918. But then, how could those soldiers recognize Freddie Jackson if he doesn't appear in historical records? The background story is a bit hazy overall, but the reputation of the photographer still gives the image creditability. On March 22, 1959, 44-year-old Mabel Chinnery was visiting her mother's grave in Ipswich, England, when she took a picture of her husband waiting in the car. But after developing the photograph, they noticed a scary figure sitting behind Jim in the back seat. According to Mrs. Chinnery, the dark stranger looked a lot like her mother, Mrs. Ellen Hamill, who was buried a week earlier. The unexplained phenomenon was reported in several British outlets, but on June 28, 1959, Parade magazine in the US featured the story as well, 
and they claimed to have asked for the opinion of an expert, who ultimately concluded it wasn't fake. The unnamed expert allegedly said, the lady in back can't be the result of a double exposure. If it were, the doors upright wouldn't block off part of her face, and she can't be a reflection in the window either. I stake my reputation on the fact that the picture is genuine. Strangely, it was never revealed who the expert in Parade Magazine was. The explanation is weird in many ways since there are countless ways to manipulate an image. In this case, two things strongly indicate double exposure, a technique that combines two different exposures on the same film. First, the white collar of the figure overlaps the material of the B-pillar of the 53 Hillman Minx. The second is that in the rear window, a body part that's most likely a shoulder and presumably belongs to the alleged ghost is abnormally positioned, and the apparition is somehow unnaturally close to the front seat. Unverified sources stated that the lady had used an Eastman Kodak Brownie camera, a very popular model at the time. Chuck Baker, a real expert, told Skeptic.com that various models could easily have taken a double exposure in the 1950s because despite the fact that the manufacturer had already introduced manual and automatic double exposure prevention technologies, they weren't standard on all devices. Regarding Mrs. Chinnery's photo, the most probable solution is that before the mother's death, she was captured on a particular roll of film. Then Mabel took a second shot on the exact same film and frame about her husband, and the ghostly effect was created. But whether it was accidental or not remains unclear to this day. The British Isles have significantly more ghost stories than most parts of the world, with origins linked to medieval castles, dungeons, and battles. The whole archipelago has a very cruel history that seriously influenced Game of Thrones, for example. One of these stories dates back to the early 1700s, when Lady Dorothy Walpole, sister of Robert Walpole, the de facto first Prime Minister of Great Britain, and second wife of Charles Townsend, second Viscount of Raynham, died in strange circumstances. The couple lived in Raynham Hall in Norfolk, England, in a breathtaking castle that was completed in 1637. However, rumors started to circulate that the wife had been the mistress of Lord Wharton before the marriage, and the violent husband suspected Lady Townsend of infidelity. According to historical records, she died in 1726 from smallpox, but many believed that her death was a cover-up and that Charles Townsend actually locked her up in a remote room of the building for years. The Raynham Hall is said to have become haunted after the alleged imprisonment, and the ghost of the lady appeared many times to guests throughout the centuries. Most notably, it's claimed that even King George IV encountered a figure in the 1800s while staying in the hall. The woman wore a brown dress and stood beside his bed. Her face was pale and her hair was disheveled. In 1835, Colonel Loftus was visiting the house with several other guests for the Christmas holidays, and he also claimed to have seen the apparition. First, along with another visitor named Hawking, they saw the lady as she approached their bedrooms. A week later, he saw the woman again as she was wearing a brown satin dress, had pale, glowing skin, and her eyes appeared to have been gouged out. These sightings led several Raynham Hall staff members to quit their jobs permanently. Another famous story comes from Royal Navy Captain Frederick Marriott, a friend of Charles Dickens, who visited Raynham Hall with a purpose. To support his theory that local smugglers were responsible for the haunting in order to deter people from the area, Marriott asked to spend the night in the manor's most haunted room. Eventually, the captain was accommodated for three days in the room where the portrait of Lady Dorothy hung and slept each night with a fully loaded revolver under the pillow. Nothing happened for two days, but on the third night, everything changed. This is how Marriott's daughter, Florence, described the events in 1891. On the third night, however, two young men, nephews of the baronet, knocked at his door as he was undressing to go to bed and asked him to step over to their room, which was at the other end of the corridor, and give them his opinion on a new gun just arrived from London. My father was in his shirt and trousers, but as the hour was late, and everybody had retired to rest except themselves, he prepared to accompany them as he was. As they were leaving the room, he caught up his revolver. In case you meet the brown lady, he said, laughing. When the inspection of the gun was over, 
the young men in the same spirit declared they would accompany my father back again. In case you meet the brown lady, they repeated, laughing also. The three gentlemen therefore returned in company. The corridor was long and dark, for the lights had been extinguished, but as they reached the middle of it, they saw the glimmer of a lamp coming towards them from the other end. One of the ladies going to visit the nurseries, whispered the young Townsends to my father. Now the bedroom doors in that corridor faced each other, and each room had a double door with a space between, as is the case in many old-fashioned houses. My father, as I have said, was in shirt and trousers only, and his native modesty made him feel uncomfortable, so he slipped within one of the outer doors, his friends following his example, in order to conceal himself until the lady should have passed by. I have heard him describe how he watched her approaching nearer and nearer through the chink of the door until, as she was close enough for him to distinguish the colors and style of her costume, he recognized the figure as the facsimile of the portrait of the brown lady. He had his finger on the trigger of his revolver and was about to demand it to stop and give the reason for its presence there when the figure halted of its own accord before the door behind which he stood and holding the lighted lamp she carried to her features, grinned in a malicious and diabolical manner at him. This act so infuriated my father, who was anything but lamb-like in disposition, that he sprang into the corridor with a bound and discharged the revolver right in her face. The figure instantly disappeared, the figure at which for several minutes three men had been looking together, and the bullet passed through the outer door of the room on the opposite side of the corridor and lodged in the panel of the inner one. My father never attempted again to interfere with the brown lady of Raynham. These are quite chilling stories, but the legend got its biggest boost when Captain Hubert C. Provan, photographer of Country Life magazine, and his assistant, Indre Shira, traveled to the neoclassical building in September 1936. They had already taken a photo of the main staircase but decided to take a second too. They were already setting up the equipment when the assistant saw something moving down the stairs toward them. Shira later said that, Captain Pravan took one photograph while I flashed the light. He was focusing for another exposure. I was standing by his side just behind the camera with the flashlight pistol in my hand, looking directly up the staircase. All at once I detected an ethereal veiled form coming slowly down the stairs. Rather excitedly I called out sharply, Quick, quick, there's something. I pressed the trigger of the flashlight pistol. After the flash and on closing the shutter, Captain Pravan removed the focusing cloth from his head and turning to me said, What's all the excitement about? After returning to the lab and developing the film, the brown lady of Raynham Hall was seen for the first time. Their story was first published on December 26, 1936 in Country Life magazine and on January 4, 1937, Life magazine featured it as well. It quickly became one of the most famous ghost photos of all time, but the jaw-dropping image received various criticisms. People claimed that somehow dust must have gotten on the lens by Shira, but it's not clear if it was accidental or not. In 2008, the Skeptical Inquirer wrote that a detailed examination of the image showed evidence of double exposure. They cited Arthur C. Clarke's Chronicles of the Strange and Mysterious by John Fairley and Simon Welfare in which they wrote, There is a pale line above each stair tread, indicating that one picture has been superimposed over the other. A patch of reflected light at the top of the right-hand banister appears twice. What likely happened is that the camera was shifted slightly during a long two-stage exposure, one with a real figure briefly standing on the stairs. Therefore, the negative would be unaltered. It means that the photo was not flash illuminated, but shot with available light thus requiring a long exposure, contradicting the photographer's claim of having made a quick snapshot. Other critics also mentioned that the apparition resembles that of a standard Virgin Mary statue, as her head is covered and the hands appear to be positioned as in prayer. Wellington Henry Stapleton Cotton, 2nd Viscount Cumbermere, died on December 1, 1891 at the age of 73, and the funeral took place on December 5 at St. Margaret's Church in Renbury, Cheshire. The British noble lived a pretty eventful life. He was born in Bridgetown, Barbados, in the British West Indies, 
when his father was the governor there. Her mother was the second wife of his father, and unfortunately, he was the only surviving son. As a young man, he matriculated at Oxford in 1837 and soon joined the military, where he retired in 1866 as a colonel. From 1847 to 1857, he was a conservative member of parliament, and in 1865 he succeeded his father in the Viscountcy and entered the House of Lords. Lord Combermere married Susan Alice Sitwell of Derbyshire in 1844, and the couple later had two sons and two daughters. The wife died in August 1869. Lord Combermere survived her by 22 years and died of coronary thrombosis at his London home in St. James Place. It is worth mentioning that the Cotton family of Combermere Abbey has a rich history and is descended directly from the ancient kings of Wessex, Charlemagne, and Henry II of England. Their primary residence was the Combermere Abbey in Dodcott cum Wilkesley, Cheshire, which was originally a Savignac and later Cistercian monastery founded in 1130 or 1133, but by 1275 it was deeply in debt and was removed from the abbot's management. After King Henry VIII ordered the monastery's dissolution in 1538, Sir Roger Cotton acquired it and converted a portion of the abbey into a country residence while demolishing the church and the majority of the other buildings. The funeral of Lord Combermere in 1891 was attended by the family, acquaintances, and staff members too. At the time, Lady Sutton was renting the abbey for herself and her siblings and asked her sister, Sibel or Sybil Corbett, to take a photo of the empty library while everyone was out. According to the story, she set up her camera with its shutter open for one hour and left the room. The photo was developed only months later after the Corbett's relocated, and upon closer inspection of the image, the transparent figure of a man sitting in one of the library chairs was spotted. It is my father. It is just the type of collar he wore, but the features are not distinct, Lady Alexander Paget, the Lord's daughter, commented. She said this because the facial features are very vague, but the apparition's forehead is high and bald, and there is some appearance of a beard. Relatives stated that the deceased had these features before his death and that the alleged ghost chose Lord Combermere's favorite chair in the room. However, many suspected tampering because long exposure is perfect for creating ghost effects on photographs. We know that the photographer left the room for an hour, and some people suggested that the butler or an old estate carpenter may have entered the library and sat down for a while, but there is no evidence for any of that and family members claimed that all the male servants were clean-shaven and most of them were at the funeral. But if we stuck with the interloper theory, that means that an unknown old man should have sneaked in and out without being seen, which is quite unlikely. It is also weird that the legs of the specter are not visible. The family told Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was particularly interested in the image, that Lord Cumbermere lost the use of his legs some time before his death, and that their absence in the photograph may be symbolical and evidential. The ghost photo of Lord Combermere hasn't been proven to be doctored and remains unexplained to this day. Upon the back of it are inscribed the words, The Ghost of Combermere Abbey. This photograph was taken of the library by Miss Corbett on December blank 1891, on the afternoon of the funeral of Wellington Henry, 2nd Viscount Combermere. The figure in the chair on the left of the photograph legless, is supposed to be a likeness of him. Today the Abbey is a tourist attraction and hotel frequently used for weddings and other social events. On June 16, 1966, Ralph Hardy, a retired United Church Reverend from White Rock, British Columbia, and his wife visited the Queen's House of the Royal Museums in Greenwich, England. It was a Sunday and the last day of their trip, and they found out they had little time before returning home, so after the National Maritime Museum, they popped into the former royal residence after 5.15 p.m. The luxurious retreat was built between 1616 and 1635 and is famous for its spiraled tulip staircase, but the Flemish painter genius Rubens often stayed there as well. The Queen's house was initially built for Anne of Denmark, the wife of King James I, Supposedly, the manor had been a gift from the king as an apology for losing his temper after Anne had accidentally shot one of his favorite dogs while hunting. In 1616, architect Inigo Jones was assigned to design the villa, but
but the queen never lived to see the majestic building finished because she died in March 1619 at the age of 44. The ground floor shell was left half built and the construction only resumed after 1629 when James's son, Charles I, handed Greenwich to his wife, Henrietta Maria, and upon completion, she became the first queen of the queen's house. The place wasn't known to be haunted, and the Canadian couple wasn't interested in anything paranormal. It turned out that upon their visit, the tulip staircase was closed to the public with a barrier and a no-admittance sign. Mrs. Hardy previously saw a picture of the staircase in a magazine and was keen to have one for herself, too. But because of the restrictions, they couldn't climb the stairs, so the only option was to take a photo from below. According to Peter Underwood's book, Nights in Haunted Houses, Reverend Hardy took a picture from below the staircase upwards, while his wife watched to ensure no one would obstruct the picture. They left the Queen's house after 15 minutes, and the photo wasn't developed until they arrived back home. One night, they showed the slides from the trip to their friends, and suddenly everyone noticed a translucent, shrouded figure in a white dress ascending the stairs with its arms stretched out along the railing. The Reverend and his wife claimed that no one was there when the picture was taken. A year later, in May, the Hardys described their equipment to Brian Tremaine, photographer of the National Maritime Museum. They used a Zeiss Icon Cantina camera with a Zavar Anastigmat lens fitted with a skylight haze filter and XK2 daylight 35mm film with a speed of 64. They weren't sure about the length of the exposure because it was darker in the closed area, but it was later estimated to be no longer than one second, and Mr. Hardy had to hold the camera by hand against a door jam to prevent blurring. Eventually, the pensioner couple returned to the museum and teamed up with Tremaine to recreate the photograph to see how such a picture could be taken of a real person. But after using yards of film, they were still unable to achieve the effect of the original shot. We are instinctively skeptical of ghost stories, but are completely mystified about this, Reverend Hardy said in 1967. Underwood ruled out the possibility of double exposure with this type of camera and asked the Eastman Kodak Company and other experts to examine the photo and the original negative, but no one found evidence of tampering, and the photo of the tulip staircase ghost remains unexplained. And it's not over yet, because the creepy story of the Hardys wasn't the last. According to the museum, Tony Anderson, one of their gallery assistants, had an unsettling experience on May 20, 2002, at around 9.45 a.m., Myself and two colleagues were talking about which breaks we were on, when something caught my eye. One of the double doors from the bridge room closed, and I thought at first it was the girl who does the talks at weekends, then realized the woman just glided across the balcony and went through the wall west side. I could not believe what I saw. I went very cold, and the hairs on my arms and neck were on end. We went into the queen's presence room and looked down towards the old queen's bedroom, and something passed through the anteroom and out through the wall. My two colleagues did also feel cold at that time. The lady was dressed in a white-gray color, old-fashioned, something like a crinoline-type dress. He recalled the situation. There were more haunting experiences around the building, including the sound of footsteps from the direction of the tulip staircase, unexplained choral chanting of children, the crying of a baby, a figure of a pale woman mopping blood at the bottom of the tulip staircase, slamming doors, and even tourists and employees being tapped by unseen fingers. Perhaps some of these are connected to a legend from the 1600s when a maid was allegedly thrown from the highest banister, plunging 50 feet to her death. Another story is about a couple who lived together at the top of the staircase, but they got into a violent argument once which somehow resulted in their infant son falling over the balcony to his death. Other employees have also experienced strange things around the Queen's house. One guard, for example, was reportedly unable to open a door in one of the below-ground passageways, so he went to ask a co-worker for help, but when they returned, the door was nowhere to be found.